I said, is this normal? And the fellow says, please define normal, Bill. You know, define it first. And what am I talking about? Well, I was talking about these people who uh, are born with XY and they change their sex. They continue to be XY, but they want to be XX, double X, okay? We have mispronouns. To, uh, his name was like Tommy, and they called her Sally at the Miss Universe context. We presented her from Nevada. We had Victoria's Secret representative, and the secret was that he was a, she was a he. <laughs> and we have these fellows who are, you know, uh, XYs fighting XXs, and people, especially women, who are fighting in the, those categories are a little upset because they say these guys, you know, uh, during their puberty, they were XYs, you know, they developed these muscles uh, based on, you know, testosterone, and now they inject uh, estrogen in themselves to grow boobs and whatever. You know, are these males or females? Should they fight against females? And so we have all this situation these days, and it's kind of weird. So this fellow says, Bill, define normal. If you say that, uh, you know, is this normal? I mean, what do you mean by that? And all I can tell you is I, I have defined the term in the past, okay? I, I have defined the term, and so let me go over the word normal again, okay? And this is the analogy so that you understand what I mean by normal in this context, okay? And you go to the river, and you see some swans, and they're all white. And suddenly you see a black swan go by. You say, whoa, I thought all swans were white. And here's this black swan, completely black swan. Oh, this is not normal. Well, is it? Well, it turns out you do a census of all the swans in the world, and you find out that 10% of them are black. Nothing racial here, it's just that it's a fact, okay? 10% uh, of the swans in the world are black. So it turns out that if you see a black swan among I don't know, nine swans, well, it's normal. It's normal because 10% of the global swans are black. That's what you call normal. But what happens when you do a study and you say, okay, in the year 1990, there were 10% of the global uh, swans that were black. In the year 2000, it was 11%. In the year 2010, it was 15%. In the year 2020, it was 20% of the swans were black. Well, now we have a problem. Not really a problem. What we have is we have a, a, a phenomenon we have to explain. Why are the number of black swans increasing as a percentage of the global population? Are all swans becoming black? And so you have to answer that question. This is no longer normal. Normal now is, is out the door because you're saying something is happening and it needs to be explained. Now, in the case of the color of swans, it may not make much of a difference. But in the case of homosexuality, it might make a little bit of difference. I mean, if the number of homosexuals are increasing as a percentage of the population year by year by year, not only is it not normal, but we got a bigger problem. This is not a cosmetic problem where the color of our skin is changing. We have a problem where, you know, we have people who are not going to be reproducing because they're not interested in the opposite sex with which they're going to be creating, you know, another human being. So this has to do with population uh, increase, right? With a rate of population growth. So now we have to address this issue. Is this is, um, is this normal, the fact that not only people are converting to the opposite sex, but that there are ever more of these people converting to the opposite sex? And, you know, uh, in 1973, you had the Psy American Psychiatry Association. Later on, three years later, we had the Psychology Association, American Psychology Association, doing the same thing. They declared that homosexuality was normal. In other words, they took it out of the list of mental um, uh, problems, okay? Later on, the World Health Organization did the same thing following their cue. And the question is, why did they do that? Was it because they decided that homosexuality was normal? Quotations. 
No, the problem was that, you know, in the last few years prior to 1973, you know, hundreds and thousands of homosexuals invaded the psychiatry association, the psychiatrist, the shrinks, and they said, doctor, cure me. I got a problem. Yeah, well, what's your problem? Well, I'm homosexual. And what was the doctor going to give them? A pill to cure them? And when they had so many people come to them, they said, look, we got to do something about this. And they finally decided, hey, we got the solution. Let's say they have no problem, period, we're done. We have no pill to give them, nothing to, that will overcome their homosexuality. So let's accept them. Let's just say that it's no longer a mental disorder. So they took it out of the list of mental disorders and they say, you guys are free, you guys are okay. As long as you don't have a problem with yourself, you're okay. That was the decision taken by the Psychiatric Association. But why did they do that? Because they had more and more and more and more cases. They had to turn it into something normal because they said, well, you know, it can't be that 10, 12, 15, 20% of the population is homosexual. We'll just call it normal. What, what the idea was and the way this thing developed was that history or historically, they had silenced homosexuality saying, you know, if you're a homosexual, you're mistreated. The law goes against you. We punish you. And so these people remain in the dark. And now that we have a little more, you know, flexibility in the law, uh, these people could come out of the closet. And all we're doing is just seeing more cases because uh, of the law, not because of something that happens in the biological world. They were always there. Now they just came out of the closet. That was the overall notion. But was that the case? Is it that these people were always, I don't know, 10, 15, 20% of the population? Or is it that the numbers have increased over the last few years? And that's for you to judge, okay? So until that question is answered, the Psychiatry Association of the United States uh, really uh, never answered the question. They just said, we're going to consider it normal because we've seen all these cases. And the question is, you know, if this was a private uh, issue between the patient and the doctor, the psychiatrist, the shrink, then we had an increase in people coming out of the wombs of women which had this, we'll call it a mental disorder until then, right? They had a mental problem. That's why they came to see the doctor. They said, I got a problem, doc. You know, I like men. I'm a man and I like men. So they had a problem. They go to see the doctor, the shrink, the numbers increase. And the doctors, instead of saying, oh, this is not normal. Instead of concluding that more homosexuals are coming out of the wombs of females, they decided, oh, this is normal. They've always been there. And the only change is that now they're coming out of the closet. It's up for you to decide, okay? That's, that's the issue there. And so, yeah, what I'm saying is normal is if there's an, uh, if it's always remains the same, the same percentage, you can say that's normal. If there's an increment, then you have to explain it. You can't say it's normal. No. And especially in this case, because remember, the purpose of sex is not like what the homosexual lobby wants to spread out there, that is for fun. Mother Nature invented sex not for pleasure. If you get pleasure out of it, hey, more power to you. No problem. <laughs> and that's good. But the issue here is that sex was invented for exclusively and only for procreation. Two homosexuals, whether two females, two males, they cannot reproduce. They have to go to the sperm bank or, you know, get a, uh, hire a uh, womb somewhere, you know. Uh, that's the only way. But two of the same sex cannot reproduce. Therefore, we have a problem because it's a violation of nature, what Mother Nature intended. It has nothing to do with pleasure. It has to do with procreation, and two homosexuals cannot reproduce, no matter how you twist and turn it. You gotta do it artificially. You gotta go get a third party, uh, the donor of the sperm or the donor of the womb, you know, in order to have a baby. And of course, uh, the question is whether this trend of uh, people becoming homosexuals or changing their sexes is normal. And if we have more and more of these every day, is this normal? What is it leading to? And under the theory of extinction, yeah, it, it goes against extinction because, it, I mean, uh, it, it, it's part of the extinction process. Why? Because um, 
you can imagine that we're going to be producing fewer children if we're becoming more and more, if a bigger percentage of the population is becoming more homosexual. Okay, so that's the theory. That's that's the notion. Okay, uh, moving on here, we have uh, Fowl says, no life can uh, travel interstellar. It is forbidden by Father Universe. That's my statement. And Fowl says, don't give your opinions. Give us your theory. This is where you do rational science, remember? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I have explained that. I, in fact, I have a video. It's, uh, you can look it up. It's called The Pioneer Anom Anomaly, and it's in playlist under gravity, and it'll explain my theory. But in a nutshell, it essentially is, uh, you know, every atom in your body, okay, is bound to every atom in the universe. Let me repeat that because maybe that hasn't sunk. An atom is something we can't even see. Uh, in case of the hydrogen atom, uh, you're talking about three angstroms, something, you know, un invisible. You can't even see it under the microscope, okay? You can't see it under the sum. You can't see it under a scanning electron microscope. You cannot see a hydrogen atom. That's how small this thing is, okay? And one of these guys is bound to every atom in the universe. I hope that sinks in. I mean, in the galaxy, in our galaxy, we don't even know how many stars there are. Billions of stars, each one with a solar system like ours, maybe, you know, with uh, planets rolling around. And there are billions, billions of galaxies. So we're talking about, uh, let's bring Carl Sagan back in, billions and billions and billions. Okay, we're talking about a big number. So one atom is connected to every atom in the universe when one atom, I mean, even in your room, you have billions of atoms. Okay, so alone, just one atom in your, in your body is connected to billions of atoms in, in, the, uh, in your room, let alone billions of atoms in the solar system, billions of atoms in the galaxy, billions of atoms in all the galaxies. I hope that sinks in, okay? It's a big number. And so people say, oh, such a big number. Yeah, and so if an atom is bound to every atom in the universe, okay, uh, you can see what uh, implications that has, okay? An atom is made of the threads coming from every atom in the universe. So yeah, uh, what can I say? Uh, if you're gonna be traveling out of the solar system like this fellow uh, wonders, right? Your atom, every atom in your body is connected to every atom in the sun, Let's just talk about the sun. Obviously, the Earth, Jupiter, Mars, the whole works. Let's just talk about the sun. Every atom in your body is tied to every atom in the sun. How many atoms are there in the sun? Have you counted them? Gazillions. Every atom in your body is bound to every atom in the sun by gazillions of ropes. I hope that sinks in. Maybe it doesn't. People, It's a number so big that it just breaks your mind. But it, that's not the point. The point is the following. You, you run away from the sun, which is the biggest mass in the solar system, right? The biggest mass is the sun. It's got all these atoms, more atoms than all the uh, planets put together. Jupiter, Neptune, the whole works. So you're running away from this, going to Alpha Centauri, the nearest star, which is just a barely a, a petty 4.3 light years away. Meaning if you travel at the speed of light, you get there in 4.3 light, uh, 4.3 years. 300,000 kilometers per second, you get there in 4.3 years. So it's far away uh, from, from a human perspective, from our everyday perspective. So you're running away from the sun. The farther away you get, all those ropes, what happens to them? Well, they kind of, you know, move uh, into a single coaxial. They kind of, you know, uh, come together the farther, farther away you are from the sun. And then there's this region, this long region, until you get to Alpha Centauri, Proxima being the first star, right? And until you get there, you know, you get this long region, 4.3 light years, that's a measure of distance, in which, you know, since you have a straight coaxial, so there's no gravity, you don't have Newtonian gravity. Newtonian gravity is only what I call the bird speed. The region coming out of the solar system where the ropes are still in a uh, triangular manner, kind of, you know, coming into what I call the linear regime, okay? So during that period that you approach the linear regime, yeah, you have the um, um, 
inverse square of the distance function. But when you get to the linear regime, there is no gravity. Now you go straight ahead. You drift to the other star with whatever you know, impetus, whatever impulse you had from the solar system, from your boosters or whatever. So uh, yeah, you can't travel to the nearest star because you'll never make it, not alive, okay? And so, well, you gotta watch the, the video to get the feel for it, but that's in a nutshell what the video says. Moving on here, next issue. Okay, it says, fellow says, it is an imperative for science to fully understand consciousness. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I'm going to roll over my tomb anyone who says consciousness. I hate the word. I don't want that word in science at all. Anyone who says consciousness is talking about religion, especially Eastern religion. So, you know, uh, get that out of my sight. Anyways, the final frontier, absolutely not, has nothing to do with anything. We know that it can't be just nothing. Uh -huh. When we so-called die, that can just happen because of the can't just happen because of the first law of thermodynamics. Energy will only alter. So he's suggesting that this consciousness is uh, energy, and it turns out energy is a concept. Okay, so what have we learned? That we have this concept called consciousness, but he thinks it's a thing. It's not nothing, meaning it's something, meaning it's an object under the definition of object. Of course, anyone who has a different version of the word object is welcome to put put it forth. Okay. Anyways, he says uh, energy. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, consciousness is is not nothing, meaning it's something, meaning it's an object, it's a thing, and that he reinforces that by saying that it's energy, meaning that it's under the mathematical physics notion, it's something. We're not talking about nothing. We're talking about a thing, an object, a body. Okay. That's what they're saying. The Leibniz experiment not only put free full uh, will free will into question; it demonstrates consciousness is non-local to the body, meaning this thing stands out parallel to the body. We have this consciousness, you know, out here. Okay, our consciousness can affect uh, affect the outcome of experiments. So not only the consciousness leaves your body; it's in your body. It it has a separate uh, existence outside the body, but now it's going to affect the experiment. This energy flows, the spirit flows, and it's going to affect your experiment. What experiment? Well, especially the double slit experiment. Some people believe in this stuff. It's unbelievable that uh, they, they truly believe that to this day, I mean, we're in the 21st century, and these people are in the days of, uh, you know, the fourth century where the mon monastic uh, um, era was in its heyday. And you know, they, they believe that in spirits, in souls, in uh, these phantoms, these things that go to heaven or hell, that they survive the body. You know, uh, some people believe that the body weighs more when, uh, when it's alive, dying, and that when it's dead, uh, it's like it weighs more, less. And they say it's because this spirit, this energy, this ghost leaves the body. So what are they saying? Are they saying that there's a spirit that has shape, maybe made out of atoms, some kind of holy atoms, because it has weight? It's a body that has, I hate to say it, but shape. It's an object. It's a thing that comes out of the body, the real body, the you know one uh, made of uh, meat, <laughs> of flesh. <laughs> Is there such a thing? These people believe in this? 21st century. They believe that consciousness comes out of the body and is a thing. No, obviously, you know, rational people, you know, just scratch their heads. They say, well, what is this guy talking about? No, the so-called spirit, soul, consciousness, mind, thought, dream, nightmare, whatever you want to call it, I don't care, is a verb. There's no physical object called consciousness that you can bring to me and put on the table because the definition of a thing is that which has shape. So no, um, this guy said it's nothing. No, uh, not nothing, he said. No, it's, a, it's nothing. It's not nothing, meaning a thing. It's nothing. There's no such thing as consciousness. A uh, thing is that which has shape. Consciousness doesn't have shape. Consciousness, is, it's worse. It's a, it's a verb. It's a concept. 
And so for people to turn this concept, this thinking like they did in the traditional religions, turn it into the soul, the spirit that goes to heaven or to hell, depending on how nice it was, you know, if it's black or white, <laughs> it's nonsense. Obviously, it's nonsense to a rational individual, but irrational people believe in this stuff. And regarding the slit experiment, that's got a very simple solution under rationality. You don't have to believe it, but we do have an explanation. Here it is. That's the explanation for, uh, you know, the slit experiment. What are we saying? We're saying that if you shine a light through a monochromatic light, right? Uh, if you shine, uh, uh, shine monochromatic light through two slits, very narrow, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, you're going to get what you see on the right. You're going to see a spreading out of the ropes, okay, that are bi binding the uh, two of the atoms. Uh, there's, if this is just an example, right? Just a sample microcosm of what's happening. We're taking two atoms on the sides of the needle, right? And we're saying that they're connected to all of the atoms on the screen. And so you have this situation where, you know, they're offset by some, some, so much of a link. And because of this uh, tiny offset, you create these uh, uh, fringes, these different patterns. So it's very simple under the rope model. It's only under mathematical physics where they have big problems with this. They can't explain it. And that's because they try to do it with math and with particles. That's the whole problem. We don't need math. We don't need particles. Particles cannot explain this phenomenon. You have to explain it with something which is elongated and binds the atoms of the needle to the atoms of the screen. And why we use a needle? Very simple. We use a needle because, you know, with a double slit, uh, the notion that the particle folks have is that the particles bounce against the uh, um, window sills of the slits. So they bounce and come in. That's the notion. But if you put a needle there, there's nothing to bounce against. There's no frame. There's no window sill to, for the photons to bounce. If you put a needle, we still can produce the pattern on the screen, but now the photons have nothing to bounce against. And so you would have to speculate or assume that the, somehow the photon turns the corner. Okay? And, yeah, explain that from a physical point of view. And you can't. That's why they don't have an answer for that question today. Under the rope model, very simple. Every atom is uh, from the source is already connected to every atom of the needle before you turn on the light. And all you did by turning on the light is just increase the frequency, meaning you shorten the link lengths, bring the, the, the ropes, in other words, the, the atoms really, because they receive this impact, right? They pump at a different speed. Now that pumping sends the rope that's connected to your eye receives a frequency that comes within the visible range. And that's all that's happening. And then, yeah, so what happens is the, that frequency, that link length, is transmitted to the atoms on the wall, and those are now pumping at a different speed. You know, they're, bum, 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 bum. they're expanding and contracting at this, almost the speed of light and sending that frequency to your eye, and that's why you can see it. You can see the fringes. So we have an explanation. So me mechanical, mechanistic explanation. And that's what uh, mathematical physics doesn't have, even to this day, an explanation for. Okay, uh, another issue related to my subject that I like so much, Neanderthals. The fellow says, clothing might not have been required in Africa, but it would have been needed by any uh, furless hominids <laughs> exposed to cold weather conditions. Okay, he's saying that the Neanderthals in the Arctic region would have had to have uh, worn clothes. They couldn't have survived otherwise. Okay, Neanderthal would have needed clothing of some time to have survived European and Asian winters. Denisovans uh, were closely related to Neanderthals and would have also required clothing to survive. Is this true? Did the Neanderthals wear clothes? That's the bottom line. That's the question. Were they dressed like that guy there, you know, with furs and whatever, or like the other monkey on the right? Which monkey is the correct Neanderthal? Will, will the real Neanderthal please stand up? Okay, let's find out. Here we have it. These are the Neanderthals that Hollywood puts out there, and they dress them all up. And so people get used to these notions, okay? And they say, yeah, we, we understand that the Neanderthals had to be covered because it was so cold in those days in the Arctic. And so this is what you see every day, and that's what you believe, okay? And so I'm going to modify that a little bit, and here it is, okay? Let me put it over here so that we educate you a little bit. 800,000 years ago, 800,000 years ago, before any Neanderthals were alive on Earth, before they existed, before they came into being, before they evolved, 
there was a two-legged creature in London, <laughs> okay, in Happisburg. 800,000 years ago, there was a two-legged individual, certainly an erectus or an uh, um, homo antecessor, one of those, maybe a Heidelberg, I, I don't care, one of those guys. They were already living in Happisburg, Arctic weather, hunting mammoths. Just look it up, okay? Not only have they found footprints, they have found bones of liquidated uh, mammoths uh, around a the fire. There was some kind of two-legged creature. Did that creature wear clothes? Wear clothes invented 800,000 years, almost a million years ago. That's the question for you, okay? And so, again, now you got to do your research. Uh, I'm saying that there was no, there were no clothes 800,000 years ago. There were no clothes 500,000 years ago. There were no clothes 300,000 years ago. Clothes were invented, in, in, from my research, I can tell you that clothes were invented around 35 to 40,000 years ago by humans. Uh, people, clans that came from Africa, they drifted into Europe because the Neanderthals were no longer there. That's why they could enter Europe. They entered the Neanderthal crawls, so to speak, and they entered their caves. They probably found the Neanderthals bones there dead and they kicked them aside and say, I'm going to live here now. And uh, they said, oh, it's so cold in here, you know, and so they started building clothes. They invented needles. They uh, invented threads. They probably put furs together as they moved gradually into the Arctic weathers. Little by little, they they uh, they started, you know, weaving clothes or using um, uh, the skins of animals, which they sewed together somehow. Okay, and so I'm saying that uh, clothes were invented when humans, the only animal that ever invented clothes, entered into Europe around 35 to 40 thousand years ago when the Neanderthals were gone. Neanderthals were furry animals. They were the woolly man. Before then, they were the Heidelbergs. They were the woolly men that also lived in Arctic weathers. Before them, you have the either, take your pick, the Homo erectus or Homo uh, antecessor, whichever one. Um, and they lived in Arctic Europe at least 800,000 years ago. And they had no clothes. Okay, so you figure it out. And then, uh, just in case, you know, you have wolves today. They sleep in the snow. They say, huh, how can that be? Well, you, have you heard of the polar bear? Uh, does he uh, hide in the snow and say, oh, it's so cold today? No, he sleeps in the snow. Wolves sleep in the snow. The buffalo up there also sleep in the snow. And you say, well, humans can't sleep in the snow. Well, not us. That's our puny... Humans, you know, we have th thin skin. Neanderthal, they had thick skin because they came, they evolved from the high doublers who evolved from the Homo erectus or the antecessors. So they, they had already thousands of years of acclimatization to the Arctic weathers. Okay, so yeah, uh, high, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Neanderthals never wore clothes. They didn't wore sandals to walk in the snow. Oh, it's so cold. No, they, they put their foot, feet, just like a wolf does. Puts his feet directly in the snow and just, he's used to it. <laughs> and you say, how can it be? Yeah, yeah, uh, please understand that wolves do not wear sandals. <laughs> they do not wear boots, shoes, anything like anything leather covering their feet. Okay, another fellow says, uh, you say that human extinction in, is inevitable. Nothing can be done. Um, it is nature, so it was decided from the beginning, living things at some point cease to exist. Your theory is genetic. No, it, it, it ain't, but let's continue. Hope is uh, a humane uh, feeling of confident expectation in the realization, present or future, of what one desires. Desire to live. Also a natural mechanism that apparently contrasts that of planned extinction. Mine is not a planned extinction, and what was the other one? Uh, no, I'm not saying that, um, was it, uh, that it's a genetic theory. He's got it all wrong, okay? So I want to clarify those two things. It's not genetic, and it's not planned. There's no God out there that says, I'm going to plan the uh, death of humans, or of any animal for that matter, or of plant. No, that's not the way it works. The way it works is that, uh, the facts are 
that periodically all plants, all animals, every single species of plants, every species of animal becomes extinct. I hope that sinks through, okay? It must come to an end. It comes to an end, why? Because if it doesn't come to ex an end into extinction because of a mass extinction, and I'm just going to put that one aside, it comes uh, to an end through a background extinction. What's a background extinction? It's the disappearance of one species. One species alone disappears. Everyone else doesn't even notice it. Everybody else is doing everything, just continues living as if nothing. One species disappears. How did that one species disappear? How did Mother Nature select that one? Well, it selects all of them. All of them will disappear in the same way unless a mass extinction gets them. How did they disappear? They disappear for two reasons. One is their population pyramid overturns and they lose their genetic diversity after gazillions of years of inbreeding. If you inbreed, you lose your genetic diversity. If you lose your genetic diversity, not because of diseases like the geneticists tell you, if you lose your genetic diversity, you're not going to have children in the end. You're going to stop having children. Your children are going to be retarded, which is what's happening today with humans. We have been inbreeding for 200 to 300,000 years since our species has been on the planet. And what do you think happens after inbreeding for 200, 300,000 years? Well, you have mental problems. You have physical problems. You have children with six fingers, you know? I, I have to put a sixth one because I don't have six fingers. <laughs> That's what happens. You can't have normal children after uh, extensive inbreeding. So that's the problem. It's not a, that you're, you're liable to catch a disease like the geneticists say. No, it's that uh, two or three generations down the road, you won't have any normal children. Okay, that's the issue. And so, you know, uh, it's not that it's uh, programmed by God or Mother Nature or Father Universe or the devil. You know, it's that uh, you can't continue inbreeding. That's one issue. The other one is that, you know, you have a population uh, problem. And let me explain that real quickly here, okay? This is the population problem. Here you see the population on Earth. We're uh, almost 8 billion people. Uh, apparently, according to the latest numbers, we're like 7.9 billion people on the planet, okay? Okay, and uh, how much land area is there? Well, there's about 150 million kilometer, square kilometers. That comes out to around 53 people per square kilometers. That's a lot of room. If you look at, um, you know, if you look at one square kilometer, that's a lot of space, and you can put a lot of people in there. And uh, we're saying that the population on Earth is about 53 per kilometer square. That's uh, low density. So you say, uh, okay, so we have a lot of room on the planet. Forget about 8 billion. We could put a trillion people on the planet. One trillion people on the planet we could put. Many times as many as we have today. And physically, Physically, we could fit on the planet, on the, and that's only on the land area. I remember the water area is like 510 million kilometers squared, and uh, that's about two and a half times more than what the land area is. So, you know, assuming we could live on the oceans as well, you know, that number 53, uh, you know, we could live, put a lot more people here on the planet. What's the problem? Here's the problem. The problem is that we're all nucleated in cities. We're not uniformly distributed across the planet. These are the cities with the highest density on the planet, which are big cities. Okay, these are the big cities with the highest density. Okay, and you probably see some of your cities there. Uh, Mumbai is the number one in the planet. It's got 14 million people. The last one, which I thought was probably one of the first ones, is Tokyo. But the only reason for that is Tokyo has been expanding size-wise, you know, sideways. And so uh, that's why they're number 50. Otherwise, you know, if you go to Tokyo, it's, a, it's an ant hole. Okay? But here's the issue. What did I say just now? 53 people per kilometer squared. And here we're talking about almost 5,000 people per kilometer square in Tokyo, all the way to about 30,000 in Mumbai. 30,000 people per kilometer square. That's what you see in Mumbai. And these are not the biggest, uh, these are not the most uh, densely populated cities on the planet. The, these are the, uh, here, let me show you this. Uh, let me get it here. These are the cities that with the most population density on the planet. They're not the largest cities, okay? And uh, they're smaller cities, but they're more densely populated than the big cities. 
Give me a second here. Get this out of the way. Okay, uh, so these are the uh, most densely populated cities. They're not the biggest cities. And, and again, you can see the numbers. Uh, they're, you know, they're in the thousands per kilometer square. So what's the issue? The issue is that here is the, um, the trend. Where is it here? This is the trend for the whole planet, okay? This is uh, the growth rate for the entire planet. You can see it's going down to zero, maybe by mid-century, sometime in mid-century, this century. We're not going to have more people being produced on this planet. We're going down, 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 down since the year 1963. And why is that so? Well, because when you move to the cities, families that move to the cities from the country, they no longer have children. The cities are not placed to have children. No one was going to have 10 children in a family anymore. You can't have 10 children in an apartment anymore. That was okay in the country. Our great grandmothers, they had 10 children. Half of them died. Great. No problem. Five of them continued. That's no longer going to happen. Women today, many of them don't even want to have children. And those that do have one or two. That's it. And so when you come to the city for social and economic reasons, no one has children. So it's, it's not a question of either traveling outside the, you know, the earth, uh, saying, oh, I'm going to colonize, uh, you know, Mars. <laughs> yeah, or the moon. No, we're not going to have children because, as you can see in the graph, we stopped having children, and we're going to have fewer and fewer children as time goes by from now on. Partly because of homosexuality, which is on the rise, I'm saying. They're not going to have too many children or any children at all, okay, most of them. Then you have uh, women today, they don't want to have children. You move to the cities, you change the culture, you change the social environment, you change the economics. Uh, you no longer need to um, maintain your uh, parents. Uh, you know, the, the state does that. You don't have to take care of the children because kindergartners do that. You know, it's the state that takes care of everything. So, you know, people don't have children and people seem bogged down by children and they see them as anchors. I want to go on vacation. I can't because I got the, to take care of the children. Or the children don't have vacation from school, so I can't go on vacation. And, you know, people see that. The young people see that and say, oh, I don't think I want to have children yet. I'll have them when I'm, what, 75 years old. <laughs> so they postpone. They don't have children. Then they have them when they're old, and that's when the children come out retarded as well. <laughs> so <laughs> it all works in, in the worst possible way. So, so the issue is we're not going to go out of the solar system because we don't need more space. It's not like we need to expand our population to Mars and later to Pluto and then who knows to Alpha Centauri and uh, to the entire uh, galaxy. We have more than enough space here on Earth for people. We're not producing people right now because everybody is moving to these ant holes called cities. And instead of having 53 people per kilometer square across the Earth, what we have is thousands, what, 30,000 people in a given city because everybody moves to the city like in Mumbai. So everybody moves there and everybody lives in this ant hole. And when you're in the ant hole, you don't produce children. That's the situation. And so, yeah, that conduces to a no growth and it kills the economy because uh, what is the economy, human economy? It's uh, more profits next year, more sales next year and less costs. What does that mean? That you need more people to buy your things and fewer workers. <laughs> you got to cut down on labor because that's cost and you have to increase your sales. That's uh, revenue. That's, that's our mentality. That's our economic system. And what's happening out there is something different. You have fewer people being born, fewer demand being created for the future. And meanwhile, yeah, the other part is, is on target. You know, we're producing uh, machines that replace man. So we're, we're having less work, less labor, and fewer customers. That's the situation. Now you run that to the future and tell me where that's going to end.